been a long day full of incredible information from start to finish. Um, we have our final presentation now, and this is about the settlement approach and CCCM application. And I'd like to welcome Louise Dalla, Tulio Matteo, Giovanna Federici, and I think starting Hilmi Mohamed. So over to you, Hilmi. Um, actually, I, I will um, I will quickly just say a few words be before handing over to um, to Ilmi. So I'm uh, very happy that we are concluding this uh, long and beautiful day, going back uh, again and again to the topic about working uh, in urban setting. Um, and we are with us, uh, as uh, Charlie you mentioned, uh, Louise, Ilmi, and Tulio. Uh, that will introduce the settlement guidance note and all the process uh, behind it. Um, I had the, the pleasure to contribute to the drafting uh, of this guidance note, uh, bringing uh, uh, you know, my experience or our experience of adapting a management methodology, methodology to urban setting, in particular regarding the aspect of community governance and community participation, uh, communication with community more in general, uh, but then also support to uh, local coordination and um, let's say multi-sectorial approach. Uh, and I think it is great that uh, this guidance is uh, you know, the result of different practitioners, um, different um, sectors, uh, clusters, uh, because I believe that this is the, you know, the crucial point of um, a settlement approach. And uh, yes, I would um, hand over to Ilmi that I don't see. Okay. Now, yes. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, uh, Giovanna and CCCM colleagues uh, for the opportunity. So I, I'm just going to give you a, a quick brief uh, uh, update on the working group uh, for those who was not there when Seki presented the other day. Um, so the working group started in uh, about two years ago. Uh, within the global shelter cluster, but we have been engaging uh, with multiple clusters, uh, the, with CCCM especially, uh, very active participation from multiple uh, people working uh, in CCCM issues. But uh, overall, uh, I think the working group, uh, primarily uh, uh, co-chaired by uh, Impact, CRS and Interaction, uh, we had probably about uh, 18 to 20 working group meetings uh, over the years. So we had uh, several um, field visits uh, to understand uh, what uh, a settlements approach would look like and how would uh, in theory and in, in practice. Uh, so it started with a, a, a compendium of case studies, which contains uh, about 30 case studies, I think. Um, and we did an analysis and um, kind of uh, 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 took the key uh, aspects of uh, how it is working, uh, how it could work. I will hand over to uh, Louise, who would uh, go through uh, what this uh, guidance is about, uh, which is a collaboration with multiple organizations um, giving input uh, written by different uh, experts on different chapters and also with a peer review committee uh, that uh, looking at uh, giving us comments. Uh, it's funded by OFTA, uh, now BH BHA, and uh, uh, it's in Global Shelter Cluster uh, website. And find all of it. Hello, everybody. This is Louise speaking. Can you can you hear me? We can. Nice. I just wanted to make sure that it's working. It's the first time I've ever shared my screen on Zoom, so it's uh, great to to put it into practice. So good evening, everyone. This is Louise speaking from Geneva. Thank you so much for those who stayed on the line um, after this very long day. So what I'm gonna tell you about today is the, the, the concept of the Selman's approach. And then Tulio will take you through the specificities of the, of the guidance note. 
So it's really been a pleasure to I'm work Sorry with to you. interrupt. I just wondered if you could lift your screen a little bit, we'd be able to see your face. We can just see your hand on the keyboard at the moment. Sorry, like I have a replacement computer that's not really fit for hindrances. So I hope it's better now. It's 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 just good to see you. Thank you. And sorry in, to interrupt. Uh, it's, it's already night time in Geneva right now, so it's not ideal. But okay. So um, what is the Selman's approach? So to start with, I'll just like to go back to uh, the consultations we had with uh, all of the partners who contributed to help us redefine and define the Kinset. So it's really a framework uh, for eight agencies and local organizations to work together uh, and deliver more locally targeted, uh, owned and impactful interventions on the ground. And what we're, what we'll learn from the consultation process until now, and what we keep learning every day, um, thanks to, uh, get togethers like the CCCM retreat is that we're like the humanitarian community is definitely facing stressing factors such as urbanization, displacement crises, natural disasters, protracted armed conflicts that often occur simultaneously rather than in parallel and that tend to sort of generate self-reinforcing -re humanitarian needs, especially in fragile territories. So they affect uh, every aspect of the, the local environment and uh, community uh, groups living in specific areas. Um, and this growing complexity sort of demands a localized um, and multi-sectoral and collaborative approach to address these multi-faced vulnerabilities. And it also demands aid organizations uh, to prioritize interventions in the most affected territories. And this is where the settlements approach really comes into play. Um, it adopts the human settlement as the primary unit to build interventions. It aggregates um, sector-specific expertise and goes beyond status-based beneficiary targeting logics to adopt more of a community-based uh, targeting logic. So again, the, the, the key thing is really to use the human element as the primary unit. Um, and it also, it, so it provides sort of a social spatial framework to work from. Um, so to start with, or to continue at least, um, we can ask ourselves this question, what is a human settlement? So it's simply a place where, where people live, in fact. And by this, um, we don't only mean the physical environment, nor the administrative boundaries of specific places, rather reflecting on how local communities perceive their own territory. Um, from their own sort of socio-economic and socio-cultural standpoints. So it's really taking time to ask ourselves before we start an intervention, what makes this area theirs? And obviously it's not gonna be up to aid, aid organization to answer that question, but it's gonna be fairly participatory and, and collaborative. But generally speaking, um, it's useful to, to say that the geographical scale of um, settlements where aid organizations are gonna have the capacity to intervene multi-sectorally, it's gonna be quite granular. Like we're talking about neighborhoods, districts, groups of villages, that's really going to depend on um, the setting, on the crisis at stake, et cetera. Uh, but it's generally gonna be uh, quite granular. And what we also learn from the process of defining what we mean by the Selman's approach um, is that there's, there's an increasing and increasingly acknowledged need to consider the whole population that's uh, living in specific crisis affected settlements uh, based on overall vulnerability rather than on specific community groups. And also that the demonstration of the root causes of vulnerability that generally hinges on um, the specificities of the local context in which the crisis occurs. So for CCCM practitioners, which I'm not, by the way, so it's going to be good to discuss. It might create an interesting segue to expand the scope of the assistance to the larger community area where displacement sites are located, for example 
as it's already being done in a number of cases. So we heard really fantastic and fascinating um, presentations from CCCM practitioners yesterday. Um, so thank you again, guys, for bringing that to, to the table. Um, really quickly, because I don't want to take uh, too much time and give a chance for Tilio to get into the guidance note. Um, but this also responds to a need for humanitarian and aid organizations in general to sort of operationalize the recent commitments that have been made by the community in the recent years. So the Grand Bargain Agenda, the Nexus Agenda, the new way of working, the localization agenda. It's sort of difficult to make them all, all work together uh, in a single intervention. But that's why it's useful to sort of have a model that make it work to work together to make it happen on the ground. So it's uh, a bit of a theoretical concept, I know, but we'll be glad to see how this will all come into play and into, into practice. But just a uh, key takeaway, we're hoping that uh, this settlements approach and the guidance note that goes together with it uh, will really help uh, us all operationalize, materialize these commitments uh, on the ground by focusing on crisis affected settlements. And last but not least, uh, you might ask yourselves, that sounds like a lot, is it appropriate everywhere? In theory, it's applicable for any type of settlements, but the compendium of case studies that heal me introduced uh, earlier really demonstrated that it tends to work best in some typologies of context uh, where the population base is not too fragmented, um, where the humanitarian coordination architecture that's usually set up at the national level and sometimes at the sub-national level does not penetrate, which means that you're going to be intervening in an area where there's little coordination happening. Uh, because it's just too granular for the coordination system to, to focus on. Uh, also, contexts which where the population is diverse and has complex and interdependent needs. It's also important to have local authorities present, credible and willing to partner, which may be a bit more difficult to achieve in contexts where local authorities are parties to the conflicts, for example and a number of other parameters that I invite you to take a closer look at when the guidance note is ready, which should be in a few weeks from now, and we're very excited to, uh, to have you read it. So over for me, um, off to Julio, will guide you through the document itself, and thanks a lot. Hello, hi everyone. Um, now I'm going to present you about the guidance note, some more specifics. So let's go to the to the next slide, please. Um, I think uh, Luis already presented it, and actually Giovanna also mentioned uh, the the guidance note is the contribution of uh, the expertise of uh, I would say a hundred of uh, experts and practitioners from the field. And now it's been uh, put together with uh, consultations and debates, and it, it's now uh, authored no? um, into a document. But now, as Luis just said, it's uh, at its final stage. Uh, we have um, a professional editor helping us have the final package. Um, so next slide. And maybe before uh, I continue now with this, I want to say that the, the important thing of the document is that in, it's been, um, the contributions have come from different sectors, no? including CCCM and people and that have that expertise. Um, and the content that you will see in the guidance note is divided in three chapters. Uh, the first chapter is more on the, oh, basically the, all of the, content that uh, Luis just presented about uh, why are we doing this, uh, the benefits and who, uh, when is it appropriate. Um, so basically uh, this content that, and I would say the, the 1.5 on how it's complementing the existing humanitarian systems, no? Um, 
then on chapter two, you will see that uh, it's also divided in four sections. And the first one is focusing more on how we identify uh, the scale of the settlement that we are working on and how the factors that go beyond space and demography are used to actually define that uh, the population that we are going to be working in. Uh, section 2.2 .2 is more, no problem. Section 2.2 .2 more on, on how we get a comprehensive engagement and how we make the most of uh, agencies working in multiple sectors. 2.3 and 2.4, as you can see, it's more about having a, an inclusion, inclusion and multiple voices uh, from the population, but also on different stakeholders uh, working in the area. That means private sector, uh, local government, national government, and aid agencies, and so on. Um, next slide. And then I would say that uh, chapter three, as you can see, is more on, on the methodology and the steps that actually uh, help us put the, the settlement approach in practice. The first section, uh, we have the, the steps and methods that we would use to delineate the target settlement. Uh, that means we will be reflecting on uh, the participatory mapping, the geospatial analysis, and how we use that to set up the boundaries. Um, section 3.2 is more on the on how we should cover the, the joint assessment now that, that make sure that uh, uh, we make it comprehensive. 3.3 um, is how do we transition that into the into our response plan, but then at the same time, how we identify leadership. And, and here I want to stress that we are uh, trying to promote, uh, I think as we've seen, and you, as you have seen in other presentations, the local leadership um, and 3.4 is more on on how we uh, you know we, we make sure that those uh, objectives in the plan are put in place and how the local leadership and the population is maintained in the driving seat and maybe an addition to to this chapter is that I found particularly interesting to to connect it with the set case studies uh, the urban settlement case study compendium that uh, has been mentioned before because you can really see the, the you know you can really connect with the practice with how it's been done somehow in the past where it has been very challenging and then how we can improve in the future um next slide so by the end of this month we hope to have the final version it's now also through the edition and graphic design. And then in December, we will start sharing it with all of you. And we have planned as well a, a workshop where we will um, engage all of you in not only the conceptual, con like sharing the, con the concept, but also trying to make it more practical so we can, even if it's remote, we can have a, an experience of how putting it together. Hand over to you, Luis. Mm, thanks. I think over to Giovanna. Um, yeah, I have a, a couple of questions for you guys, and then maybe Charlie, you can tell us if there is something from the chat. Um, maybe, I mean, maybe to you, Tulio. Um, I, I was wondering how are you. Um, um, what, who do you think will use this uh, this uh, guidance? Uh, um, it will be like field practitioners, uh, people that are making strategy. Um, I don't know, local authorities. What do you think would be the first uh, user? Yes. So I think that the user is field practitioners, but I think it needs to be from aid agencies, but also the uh, take this at the local level so they can understand where we maybe from international <coughs> organizations are coming from. So we can speak the same language uh, and you know uh, communicate much better. 
-hmm. And then I, I was also wondering if, um, I mean, do you think that uh, 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 this guidance would be, you know, helpful to um, foster collaboration and uh, synergies between, uh, you know, sector, cluster, agency? I saw that the one before in the, uh, in the chat mentioned about competition. So, um, yeah, can this contribute positively as a convener in, um, in this process? I think, um, I, I'm wondering if Hilmi wants to answer that question or uh, um, considering that he's been Okay, uh, no, I, I, I can try, but um, uh, let others, um, if uh, Seki also around, uh, maybe he can add uh, with Lu Luis. So uh, the, the guidance is not very prescriptive, uh, saying this is X, Y, Z, you should do. It only considers a very high level uh, uh, considerations uh, for people who are working to understand and, and see how they can operate. Uh, as we, uh, by Luis mentioned, it, it is not a, a tool that we expect it may work in every single uh, response, but uh, it is important uh, for people to understand the basic concept so that they could uh, see if it applies. Um, so th that is the first thing. Um, th between the clusters, we did uh, discuss among several key cluster uh, counterparts uh, on working, uh, but the guidance doesn't say how, how do you do wash in this or how do you do shelter. Uh, but we, we are looking at multiple uh, uh, multi-sectoral work uh, because the needs of the people are not either one A or B uh, uh, in the intervention. So that is something we need to consider. Uh, we may or may not apply uh, every single one of them. Uh, but uh, Luis, do you want to say uh, something uh, in addition? I'll... Uh, sorry, I was already, already uh, unmuted. Um, so the question of collaboration across sector and how sector uh, usually or should uh, coordinate really relies on how this, this, the coordination system functions in each country of, of operation in each, uh, in each crisis. Uh, but I would just like to, to take us back to a very interesting example that was shared uh, just yesterday by the CCCM Yemen team about how they managed to set up very localized uh, coordination groups that were inclusive of the local communities, local representatives, as well as colleagues from other sectors to coordinate uh, multi-sector interventions at the level of the sites and the neighboring areas where they were working. And they seemingly reported that they were all reporting to, to the national, to the area coordination system and to OCHA ultimately. And that was really a good way to enable smooth reporting, but also a better access to, uh, to difficult areas. So that's only one example of how it's going to work. As we mentioned earlier, uh, it's really uh, a tool for the collaboration to be uh, more inclusive of the local representatives and local authorities. So the capacity to put that into practice and have local authorities co-lead the process will actually going, is going to depend <coughs> in each uh, crisis about the, their readiness to do so, their capacity to do so, and the capacity of the humanitarian system and certain clusters to provide the capacity that's required uh, to make it work. Uh, but again, I, although like we're, as the Urban Settlement Working Group, uh, we're really convening these discussions, uh, providing a space for uh, such practice to be translated into guidance and theory where relevant, uh, but the ultimate decision of how it's going to be 
formalized or put into practice really relies on implementing agencies on the ground uh, themselves. Over for me. Thanks, Louise, and thanks everyone. Really interesting discussion. I think you've, you've definitely picked up on the question that the Wana put into the chat about competition. Um, there's another interesting question that's coming from Brian. I think it relates exactly to that ultimate point that Louise made. And the question is, what body is responsible for defining these geographic areas and bringing together all the actors and clusters who choose different areas based on their own criteria and needs? So, who is responsible? If I, I can take a, a, a stab at it. Um, so uh, when we looked at uh, the case studies uh, we, uh, out of the 30, there are some examples of uh, how this uh, evolved, uh, maybe the right word. Um, so for example, Northern Nigeria, there's a case study uh, where uh, this happened sort of outside of the formal cluster system in uh, in in areas where uh, NGOs, um, I can't remember all of them, but uh, they uh, try to coordinate uh, on that. Uh, there are other case studies uh, from, uh, I think, Mozambique. Uh, there were some working groups uh, happen in the long term, not the earlier stage, but uh, later stages. Um, so there are some examples. Uh, so it, be, it is not definitive uh, whether it's come under one cluster system as, as a formal mechanism or uh, NGOs uh, get together, maybe four or five of them working in the same area. They, they uh, discuss and coordinate among themselves uh, how they want to do it. So it is still, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of, it's widely open. At, um, we didn't uh, go into too much detail because it, this, this need, uh, the way, the, uh, another thing to say is the the guidance is, a step in time, uh, like Sphere or other guidance. I think as people practice, as people try to implement or operationalize, uh, as we learn, it need uh, regular updating and changing things, uh, you know, include the other, other considerations. Uh, so it, it is uh, the first version of uh, things. I'm sure there's multiple other challenges going to come. Sure. Uh, I don't know if it answered that question, uh, Brian. Yeah. If I may add, also very pragmatically and practically, as, as we said, um, generally speaking, the geographic scale at which the settlements approach will be implemented will be very granular. It's because it, it takes a bit of time and resources to implement. Uh, because it's so collaborative, it goes uh, deep into into each sector. So how it's like who is going to participate is not a set in stone list. Um, it's really going to depend on who's on the ground when the, the project and the process starts. And it may very well be that one agency, uh, because they have capacity and funding to intervene in one area, start the process and bring more agencies and more per partners in who will aggregate incrementally their sector specific expertise to make it work. So pragmatically, it's very possible that it starts small and not necessarily formally endorsed. And as sort of it, it takes, um, it generates buy-in buy and, and a better impact, more agencies more development partners, more CSOs are going to be onboarded. Um, so we don't have a, a large enough, I would say, critical mass of experience uh, at the moment to really say this is the direction, the institutional direction in which it's going. Uh, what we're doing is trying to open up the conversation uh, to all sectors. Uh, and to broaden it so it can become more and more practical and more and more clear uh, where, where the lines of responsibilities appear in the future. Thanks, Louise. Um, that's helpful. And thanks also, Hilmi, for, for your answer too. I think that's, that's gone as far as you perhaps can to answer that question. Um, it's, it's a little undefined, but I guess that's the nature of, of a new initiative and a, and a, a developing initiative. 
We are pretty much out of time um, at the end of this amazing day. Um, I think there may be some plans for some folk to stay on and, and, and just have a chat in, in a social context. But for those of you who are here for business only, or at least need to get off and do things. I just wanted to sort of formally close the day. So firstly, let me say thank you to Tulio, Louise, Giovanna and Hilmi for that fantastic presentation. And thank you to everybody that's been involved today. Um, 22 sessions, I think in total, and probably over 50, if not 60 different people involved in making this happen. And that doesn't mention any of the people behind the scenes um, in the CCCM cluster. Um, who have been involved in the different working groups and, and SAG as well. So absolutely incredible. Before I hand over to Juan, just for a few final words, I wanted to remind everybody who is here of what we have next week, because we are just at the halfway mark. We're just halfway through this amazing event. Um, you'll see on my little path here, we have Practitioners Day on Friday the 6th. Um, and a lot of the subjects that have come out today, we're going to be taking on next week. So on Monday, we go to transition and the nexus, which is a subject that's come up again and again and again and again. So that should be fascinating. On Tuesday, physical environment. On Wednesday, we look at standards. And on Thursday, we're looking at how all of this stuff comes together in terms of what we do going forwards and strategy. The stars you see there are reminders that we have our networking days. So that's just an hour long opportunity to, to just spend time meeting, greeting and getting to know other CCCM practitioners, maybe old friends or maybe new friends. So do please come to those. And an administrative reminder that our session on Monday is actually going to start with one of those networking sessions at 1.30 Geneva time. So rather than starting the substantive session at 1.45, like we normally do, we'll be starting that at 2.45 Geneva time. But do come along anyway at 1.30, join the networking session, and then we'll have a short break before we move into the substantive session at 2.45. With that, I will hand over to Juan to say a few words before we close the day. But thanks, everybody. Thank you, Charlie. I just want to maybe just to echo that and just to say thank you for to everyone for joining in, for chipping in, for sharing with us um, the different discussions, um, different examples. And you know, it's really great to, we feel like it's such a great space to just basically you put out an open space for whoever wants to come and to talk about anything they feel is important <laughs> related to their practice. I also want to thank especially Jennifer because she was the one who go, one, we have to have this, you know, like we can't not have it this year. Initially, um, Jen wanted to have 20 hours for 2020. Um, we managed 10 for you this year, Jen. So, you know, hopefully next year we'll do more, better, bigger. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. And join us for a drink if you're not busy. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Bye, so much. Guys. We'll see you.